Look, if the title didn't make it clear enough, there's some pretty nasty stuff in this one, so be warned. In 1987, a series of strange occurrences began to take place in Massachusetts surrounding the mountain, Greylock. That ancient spire towering above the state, beckoning life to envelop it. In the modern age, it's become little more than an attraction for hikers. A bit of nature to be conquered, consumed. Yet the mountain itself is home to something wrong. Something that eclipses our very humanity and forces us to reconsider our place in the universe. Something ancient. Whatever it is, it's awake. And it's reaching out into the world around the mountain, twisting life into something it was never meant to be. Bodies fall from the sky. Children vanish from their mother's wombs. Human beings are twisted into monsters with otherworldly powers. This series poses hundreds of questions, and I'll do my best to give you at least a few answers, but it's frankly terrifying. I wish that I could console myself. I live near the mountain, and... <sighs> what if I'm next? I lie awake at night, waiting for someone to knock on the door and deliver me from this nightmare or for something to break in and end it. But there's no one to knock. I'm all alone. But you aren't alone. I'm here with you. That's right, I'm, I'm not alone. I have you, my only friend. But before we go any further, I'd love to tell you about today's sponsor, FlexiSpot. FlexiSpot were kind enough to send over a couple of their standing desks for me to try, which ended up being perfect timing, as I was already in the market for a standing desk. They didn't really tell me anything to say, so I'm free to give you my honest thoughts. The most important question is, do they help make my videos better? Confidently, the answer is yes. This channel requires a lot of voiceover work, so being able to stand up, take a deep breath, and use my hands when recording is essential to getting an energetic narration. When I want to go back to work on writing or thumbnails, it's as simple as pressing a button. I just switch to my seated profile, and the desk goes right back down to where I want it every time. I'm also in love with how these desks look. It's very minimal and natural, which is exactly what I want from a desk. Plus, it highlights all the little friends I have tucked away around my area. If you're interested in picking up a standing desk, I honestly can't recommend these enough. This one with the beautiful bamboo finish is the Pro Unit. It's just a good, large standing desk with no frills or gimmicks. If you want something that's maybe a little more versatile, the rustic style desk that my wife uses is the Kamar. It has two USB ports for charging your devices as well as a drawer for some extra storage. You can order either one of these desks using my Amazon links in the description. Thanks again to FlexiSpot for sponsoring the video. The first of the Greylock tapes, back online, shows a sign-on process. A synthetic voice issues forth to the user through aged speakers. You'll come to know this voice, the voice of a Simeodyne USA computer, quite well. It'll be our guide through much of the series so far. Presently, it welcomes the user to Simeodyne enhanced access operations and demands clearance credentials. Whoever is attempting to access the Simeodyne records, however, is not supposed to be here. Their credentials are unrecognized, but the user manages to bypass the security requirements entirely and is granted administrative privileges. They begin to extract a large amount of data from the Simeodyne archives, and that's where the story truly begins. This whole series is told through the data that's extracted in this first video, as we watch through whatever information Simeodyne was able to gather regarding the strange happenings around Mount Greylock. The title of the first tape, Back Online, gives me the sense that we're watching Pandora's box being reopened. If you can handle watching this series on your own, I highly encourage you to do so. Do it for Dezeka 1994. The second tape, To the Mountain, is admittedly a bit confusing. It consists almost entirely of dash cam footage, which I assume to be from someone headed to the foot of Mount Greylock, based on the title, To the Mountain. 
In the background of the footage, we can hear a radio preacher giving a sermon before delivering a quote from my boy Charles Spurgeon. It's a long quote, but I think it can be summed up in one line near the end of the quote. We are not to enter the thicket in search of the lion. We may pay dearly. In other words, if you go looking for the devil, you'll find him. The driver eventually arrives at the mountain, gets out of the car, and it switches to a POV shot. An extremely garbled voice tells us the story of a party of hikers who went up the mountain. On an ordinary hike, they came across the mangled carcass of an animal. At least, they thought it was an animal. As they drew closer to the viscera, one hiker noticed a human skull, partially submerged in a shallow heap of ripped limbs and seeping fluids. The hikers were accustomed to seeing strange things on the mountain, but nothing could have prepared them for the horrors they witnessed that night. Meanwhile, the video seems to match these experiences relatively closely. I don't think that the footage was taken by the party of hikers, but it certainly parallels it. However, while the hiking party got out of the woods with only some shot nerves and mild to severe trauma, I'm not sure the driver made it out of the woods at all. They come across something hiding behind a tree, but what is it? They creep closer, closer. Instead of a revelation, the footage simply cuts to black, and then we're back in the car. The preacher continues and tells us that whether we wanted it or not, we will come face to face with the devil eventually. Our very hearts are inevitably and irresistibly drawn to him. There is a shadow nested deep within our hearts. Keep that specific word in mind, shadow. It'll become important in tape six specifically. Back to this video, however, have you noticed it yet? The car's moving very strangely, almost as if the driver from before is no longer the driver at all. Whoever's in control of the vehicle now seems altogether unfamiliar with the car. Any car, for that matter. They methodically fiddle with the lights, the blinker, the pedals, like they're trying to understand how to use it. It seems like they become frustrated and slam into the dashboard forcefully, and the dash cam cuts. When the feed returns, the new drivers figured out how to operate the vehicle, and they are freaking booking it, dude. They race away from Greylock as fast as the car can take them, back towards town. The preacher preaches still, but the radio appears to have been damaged, and the audio is now distorted. That he bestows upon you. The next video, Orientation Protocols, gives us a little more information on a U.S. military operation known as Project Stargate that's been created in partnership with Simeodyne USA. The tape is created to be viewed by a man named Alex Marsh. It's not analog horror unless there's an Alex. Alex Marsh is of little importance right now, but in tape 10, he'll suddenly become very important. Stargate honestly seemed like a really weird name to me, but apparently it's just a real-world project. Uh, it basically had to do with the government trying to develop something called a glass camera, which was basically they were going to use real psychics to astral project and observe people in the U.S. without leaving behind any evidence. So, do with that what you will. Anyway, moving on. Simeodyne's project, Stargate, is related to the study of beings known as thought forms. You may know them as tulpas if, like me, you went through a supernatural phase and you got way too excited about the Slenderman episode. In any case, if you aren't familiar with tulpas, they're basically creatures that are manifested into reality by the human will. The video suggests that even ghosts may be manifested by the departed's loved ones, a cosmic byproduct of grief. Typically, only large groups of people 
individuals experiencing extreme duress or perhaps devout monks can produce tulpas. Stargate found a way for anyone to do it on command. In a flash of supreme intellect and brilliance, they built a machine for manifesting thought forms. And in their second great act of genius, they named it the Thought Form Manifester. This groundbreaking discovery was only possible because of one man, Dr. Bernard Hayes, a renowned psychologist who we'll see more of in tape six. You'll notice that's the second time I've told you to wait for tape six. Yeah, a, a lot's gonna happen in tape six. Right now, we're still learning about tulpas, and apparently they're terrifying. The documentary tells us that they can manifest as, quite literally, anything you can imagine. A thought form might manifest itself as a chair, your neighbor, even something as abstract as sadness itself. If you can think of it, it can be physically real, all thanks to the thought form manifester. Unfortunately, this also means that the manifester can give life to the darkest recesses of our unconscious. Your worst nightmares can be superimposed into reality, forced past the barrier between existence and non-existence through the bottleneck of your mind. Use of the thought form manifester is not for the weak. The machine induces a host of unsavory side effects in the user, but they pass soon enough. In the end, all you're left with is the fruit of your imagination, only it will inevitably be twisted into something a bit more disturbing than you envisioned. Then again, maybe it's not more disturbing, but more accurate. Not that you could ever admit that darkness was inside of you, of course. <sighs> Look, I know it sounds crazy. I feel crazy for being scared of this. It's just ideas. So, <sighs> why am I afraid? You're not crazy. It scares me too. I appreciate you saying that, but I know you're just saying that. I get it. I shouldn't need a friend with me to be able to sleep at night, but... It's okay. I'm happy to help. I'll always be here for you, Crow. I want to believe you, but things are about to get so much worse. Tape 4, Unexpected Visitors, begins with a lengthy POV segment that honestly just seems like the start of an episode of Marble Hornets. Whoever's recording keeps peeking in through the windows of a house. It's hard to make out much of what's inside, but more importantly, we have no idea why they're sneaking around like this. Eventually the tape cuts, and it doesn't take long to realize that the footage is now from inside the house. It all goes black. Dude, what is up with these analog horror series and the sounds? Hearing this stuff just chills me to the bone. Anyway, the tape once again cuts to a shot of the person walking outside. They take a really long look at the moon. And then we see a recording of some typical American programming. Looks like there's a new episode of Max Headroom premiering. I thought this was just a reference to the infamous Max Headroom incident. But my buddy Manaxa actually found an interesting detail that kind of ties it in deeper with some of the theories that we both came up with. It seems like a pretty intentional choice, but I'm just going to let Manaxa tell you in his video. When the commercial ends, it's replaced by an emergency broadcast signal that notifies us of some pretty disturbing things happening around North Berkshire County, the closest inhabited region to the mountain. In a single night, there's been a massive streak of break-ins the especially violent sort. All in all, over 49 residences were targeted, which is just a staggering number. That would imply that there's some sort of group carrying out the home invasions, but who? 
the police don't make it clear what the invaders were taking, but from the found footage at the beginning of the video, I'm assuming they didn't break in to steal jewelry. I'm guessing that these break-ins were, on average, more sadism than stealing. All residents are strongly advised to gather their loved ones in the most defensible room in the house and to arm themselves with the deadliest weapon they can. Of course, just like my parents in the middle of a tornado, not everyone runs for shelter. Some people want to see the threat for themselves. Some people go into the thicket. Another portion of found footage plays from inside a house, but it doesn't appear to be an invader this time. Instead, we can hear the emergency broadcast playing on a TV in the background, and the person recording peers out of their windows. Numerous people can be heard screaming in the distance, but it's hard to say which of the screams are cries for help, and which ones are meant to lure you out of hiding. I can only assume that the person recording is summoning the courage to rush out and help. But a hand reaches in through the window, and the tape begins to glitch out severely. We can see frames of what look like faces stripped down to bare muscle, or perhaps only masks designed to look this way. The most important frame here is this one. It appears to be a mask, but it's all cracked and broken. Then. Everything goes gray. Tape 5, Not Here, Not Now, Not Anymore, contains an audio recording of an ultrasound appointment. An expectant mother and her baby are visiting a doctor for a routine checkup. Soon, the gray screen changes and reveals that we've been seeing footage from the ultrasound machine. We see the baby briefly, then there's a flash. The machine glitches, there's a loud noise, and there are a couple of hidden frames. The first of which is an article that sheds more light on the home invasions from Tape 4. It's very hard to read, but it seems to suggest that the break-ins were carried out by ordinary people. Kind neighbors and co-workers suddenly flung into a violent rage. It doesn't make any sense, but that's something you'll get used to in Greylock. As for the second hidden frame, well, it's the exact same cracked face that we saw in the last tape. After the glitches subside, the footage returns to normal, except that now, the baby is nowhere to be seen. At first, the doctor assumes that there's just something wrong with the machine, but it's able to see everything else just fine. She leaves the room, and the mother is left in the suffocating silence of an empty hospital room, all alone. She grows hysterical as she realizes the horror of the situation. The video ends with a newspaper clipping. Tiffany Crisaldi, 29, school teacher. It's an obituary. It seems that the agony of losing her child was too much. Life in Berkshire County is becoming very strange, but why? Is it the result of Project Stargate? No, Simeodyne certainly seems to have a part in all of this, but are they causing it? I don't, I don't really think so. I don't even think the cause has shown itself yet, but whatever it is, it's about to make itself much more known. Sleeping Dogs is the tape you've been waiting for. It begins with a clip from Bernard Hayes, the specialist that was brought in for Project Stargate to work on the Thoughtform Manifestor. I'm going to let you hear his short speech, and then there are a couple of details I want to point out. Humanity has stood tirelessly So, the first detail that I noticed from this speech, aside from the blasphemy, are the similarities between his description of the work left behind by mankind and Greylock itself. A tower to be climbed upon, generation after generation, higher and higher. How closely, then, does the latter half of Dr. Hayes' speech apply to the mountain? 
If the towers of science that mankind has built can put humanity on the level of the divine, does that mean that Greylock, too, is a path to the divine? The second thing I notice is that Hayes is speaking at the Symposium on Jungian Psychology and the Manifestation of Consciousness. You were given some details about the Manifestation of Consciousness side of things back in Orientation, but what about Jungian Psychology? What's that all about? I'm not a scholar on Jung by any means, but I know a couple of things about his beliefs and theories, the most relevant being that of the shadow. You can think of the shadow like this. Your mind is like an iceberg. The part of you that has friends, makes small talk, and makes decisions is the tip of the iceberg. Meanwhile, there's a monolithic, unconscious structure just beneath the surface that influences and affects everything you say, do, and think. Here's where it gets a little darker. Jung believed that this part of you, the shadow, contained all the socially unacceptable parts of your being. All the unwanted thoughts and evil desires that you ward off on a daily basis, like don't swerve off the road and into that golden corral, are a part of you that you hide and lock away. But they are nonetheless a part of you. It's just like the preacher said into the mountain, there's a shadow nested deep within our hearts. Perhaps your shadow is even more truly you than the mask that you allow others to see. We're never told why thought forms become more disturbing and dangerous when they're manifested, but I think it's because it's what our minds are really like. When a human manifests something into reality, it's not a reflection of the mask we put on every day. It's a reflection of the ugly face of the unconscious. It's a reflection of the shadow. When Dr. Hayes' speech ends, we're taken to a series of messages saved by Simeodyne from a man named Paul Morelli, with the first being sent on March 24th, 1987. Paul and his crew are miners who were hired by the Department of Defense to begin an expedition down into Greylock, but they quickly discovered that the mountain held secrets they couldn't possibly understand. There were ancient ruins within Greylock, evidence of a civilization gone by. Paul sent all this information in a report to Frank Porter the crew's point of contact with the DOD, but it was outside Paul's area of expertise. One man on the crew, Arnold Rivers, had a background in archaeology and was able to excavate some of the artifacts. You'll hear his account in Tape 8, but for now, Paul's men have run into a roadblock. There are some significant cave-ins preventing them from venturing deeper into the mountain, and it becomes necessary to forcefully clear out the rubble. After some significant effort, the crew manages to clear the path down. But now they have other problems. Weird things are starting to happen. Someone's moving out in the woods. Someone who looks... too tall? They certainly aren't part of the crew. Paul doesn't know what to make of it all, but it's concerning nonetheless. Things start to get worse. Men on the crew start to get sick, and eventually Paul catches it too. Now, he's seeing things in the woods. Their food starts to spoil faster than it ever could naturally. The hunger on the mountain becomes overwhelming. A few men decide to try to capture evidence of whoever or whatever is stalking them from the woods and they set up a hunting camera away from camp. Every night, the camera detects motion and delivers a warning, but there's just nothing. Every time Paul's men check the footage, it's captured nothing, save for some strange looking distortions. Over the course of a week, Paul's condition gets worse and worse. Still, Frank Porter refuses to respond to Paul's calls for help. Desperation rises. Paul becomes convinced that there's only one solution to help his men. He doesn't know why, but he thinks that going back into the mountain, venturing deeper into the darkness than ever before, there may be an escape from the madness and misery plaguing his crew. It was the worst mistake he could have made. But it seems like there was little he could have done to resist. After all, the human heart is drawn to the devil. I feel so sorry to make you go across that tunnel. I feel like it, I need to figure out what's down there. I think whatever's down there could help my crew. But most of all, I feel like something really bad's gonna happen if I don't go down, so... Oh, 
message 9. March 30th, time unavailable. This is your end of your messages. After Paul succumbs to madness, we see the hunting camera one last time as it finally captures what's been running around in the woods. It bears a striking resemblance to the cracked mask we saw in the hidden frames from before. There really was something in those woods with them. The men had been right all along. (sighs) I don't know how much further into these tapes I can dig. The screams, the mountain, the thought forms. It's too much for me. You have to keep going. You need to find the truth. (laughs) Why? Why should I care about the truth if it's destroying me? Isn't it better to be aware and afraid than to be ignorant? Better to see the threat coming than to be stabbed in the back? (laughs) I guess so. If you won't continue, I'll leave. What? No, you wouldn't you wouldn't do that to me. You couldn't. I wouldn't let you. Of course I could. Nothing could be easier. You fine. I'll keep going. Just stay. Please. The next tape, Back to Normal, features a news report that was delivered two weeks after a series of break-ins. I initially assumed that these were the same break-ins that we saw back in Unexpected Visitors, but once we start to put together a timeline, you'll see that that doesn't really make sense. For now, the news anchor tells us that the authorities have confirmed that the attacks were carried out by an anti-American militia group. (laughs) Well, that's a lot more normal than I was expecting. The police have already arrested several of those involved, and it seems like safety is returning to the mountain. No. What? You aren't safe. He's lying to you. Sure County. The broadcast immediately continues into the next tape. Old, odd ends, but what was that text that flashed across the screen? It appears to be from an interview with a man named Jim Milgren. These events are only the tip of the iceberg, says Jim Milgren, a former police officer who now works as a private investigator and hosts a radio show centered around government transparency and accountability. There are horrifying reports of people, healthy, grown adults, becoming deformed, growing extra limbs, teeth growing out of their scalp, people developing severe mental conditions or even sicknesses doctors have never seen. Clearly, the edits were not just on the tape that we have, but also on the original broadcast itself. The station must have been hijacked. The producers are furious. An event like this, that can ruin a station's reputation. Not only that, But the CIA is looking into the incident. It should be pretty clear to you at this point that the issue goes well over the heads of the executives at the TV station. The voice of the Simeodyne security system interrupts the video to notify us that the file we're watching has been deleted from the system entirely. That's weird. Stranger still, we accidentally end up accessing an anomalous file, one that by the computer's own admission, should not exist. Does not exist. exist. Are you sure you wish to proceed? Opening file. You know, it's very reassuring when even the text-to-speech thinks something's wrong. 
The file itself contains the personal log of Arnold Rivers, the archaeologist who excavated the ruins within Mount Greylock. This particular recording is from a couple weeks after the incident involving Paul Morelli and the on-site crew from Sleeping Dogs. It's worth noting that while we know Project Stargate has its sights set on the mountain, we have no idea why it does. I mean, I thought that Stargate was about cognitive research and manifestation. Why spend so much time digging into some random mountain? Unless... Anyway, Arnold is growing increasingly paranoid. He believes that what he found inside Greylock is putting his life in danger. The markings and artifacts within, it dwarfed every accomplishment of his career. Perhaps it dwarfed the accomplishments of all human anthropologists. Inside the mountains were ruins dating back to pre-colonial Native Americans. Viking, Arabic, ancient Egyptian. The lineage of Greylock devotees seems to span the entirety of recorded human history. No, even older. Signs and traces from cultures that we have no names for. Primordial humans who dug deep into the mountain, their hearts irresistibly driven to dig deeper still, to look upon whatever it was that drew them there in the first place. Arnold's account is interrupted by another piece of Channel 13 programming called Cosmic Mysteries. The show is all about our Earth's massive dump truck of a moon. Double cheeked up! Based on the size of the Earth, astronomers have noted that our moon should be much smaller. A popular explanation for this discrepancy is that a small, rogue planet once collided with our Earth and shattered. Countless fragments were ejected back into the vacuum of space, and still countless more were buried deep beneath the Earth's crust. Like hungry, filthy mites burrowing into a dog's hide, the interstellar splinters in our planetary skin have tainted us. We are not Earth, but a great cosmic cannibal contaminated by the fetid corpse of another world. The placement of this documentary within the tape suggests this impact as the prime mover of the events at Greylock. Eons of shifting plates raised up spires and forests and mankind itself to erase any evidence of a crater. The distortions are getting worse. It can't even hold a connection on the documentary for long anymore and it switches to audio from a 911 call. It appears there's been another break in. This time, at the home of Don Wright, the news anchor from the last tape. If you remember, it ended with Mr. Wright's face being strangely edited. Well, it appears it wasn't just an edit. It seems that the broadcaster had been dead for some time, and the edit we saw previously was a superimposed photo of his ruined face. I can only assume that this is the same state that many homeowners were found in, after the break-ins in tape 4. They told us it was getting back to normal, but everything is getting worse. Arnold comes back to us. Deep in the mountain lie stained altars, red with the life of humans and animals. The ancients came to this place to make sacrifices to the thing living in the ruins, to give gifts and treasures, to worship the monster in the mountain. When Simeodine came to Greylock for Project Stargate, they brought no offerings. What Simeodine did was nothing short of a violation. Paul and his crew stumbled into the desecration of something sacred, and yet wicked beyond measure. Was it ignorance? No, I don't, I don't think so. Even if their minds didn't know, couldn't know, their hearts most certainly did, and that makes them guilty. The next section of the tape shows us the price of blasphemy. What is a man to do when his shadow drags him into the darkness? When the puppet seizes its strings to fashion a noose for its master? Nothing is left for the man but to drown or be hung. Deep in that mind, Paul and his men choked. They squirmed and struggled and screamed until the breath was gone from their lungs and humanity gone from their bodies. Do you see it? The iceberg of man's mind as it pitches and turns, defies gravity and inverts, reaching skyward towards an endless silent sea. 
Flesh twists and tears. The abyss of unconsciousness bubbles to the surface and the men become monsters. And only those lucky enough to be cannibalized down in the mine are free from hell on earth. It's too late for the survivors. Simeodine recovers the crew, but abandons all hope of helping them. They're no longer people in need of aid, but instead subhuman specimens to be studied. Some, such as Washington and Rockford, have become aggressive and highly paranoid. Simeodine suggests high doses of a sedative called xylazin and constant restraint. Other crewmates, however, exhibit much stranger symptoms. One projectile vomits deadly nerve gas, another is immune to pain, and one has a sound mind, but intense cannibalistic urges. Strangers still are the last two patients. In the aftermath of the morelli Greylock incident, Edward Kowalski has become irresistibly persuasive. What he commands, you obey. Simeodine prevents any staff from interacting with this man and demands that he be euthanized immediately. Finally, perhaps the most horrifying transformation is that of John Rafferty. By all metrics, this man is dead. His heart does not beat, his lungs are empty, and his brain no longer functions. But his corpse does not rot. Simply being in the presence of this body will cause similar malformations as the crew itself suffered down in the mountain. It ignores all protective gear, and it has a 92% fatality rate. I can't help but wonder if the other 8% have become monsters themselves. I doubt this is the last group of half-human horrors that we'll see. Perhaps the whole point of the mining operation on Greylock was to send a group of men into the mountain for them to become monsters. Could Simeodine have known that something like this was possible? As we'll see in Tape 9, Simeodine thrives in the shadows, and they certainly know more than the average American. In any case, it's too early to say for now. We're left with only one true survivor, one single man who looked into the eyes of the devil and turned to run, Arnold Rivers. He hints at the occurrences around the mountain, the home invasions, the dead bodies falling from the sky over Cheshire, and the pregnancy phenomenon. We knew about the break-ins, and we saw an isolated incident of the pregnancy phenomenon, but we have little evidence surrounding the corpse reign in Cheshire. But Mr. Rivers is not digging alone. He's working with the independent investigator, Jim Melgren, to find the root of the problem. You'll note that this is the same investigator that was quoted in the article just a minute ago. Perhaps Jim is even the one we're watching dig through the Simeodyne archives, I look forward to watching these two as they continue to search for hope in the midst of horror. Jim Melgren, who opened Pandora's box once again in search for the truth, and Arnold Rivers, the survivor of Greylock. Honestly, I feel much better just talking about it. <gasps> that can't be. Oh my God, that's a basement door. No, 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 no. no. They're here. I'm inside my bedroom closet. I'm going to keep the tape recorder running, and I'm hiding in here with my files. If something happens to me, and you find any tapes or files somehow, please bring it to the investigator, Jim Melgren of North Adams. That goes for this video footage as well. Come on out, it's the police. <laughs> 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 
Arnold is killed by the same thought form we saw on that mountain. I was wrong. No one survives Greylock. This tape terrifies me, and it taught me something important. Cosmic horror is not about space. Cosmic horror is not about super powerful aliens, and it's not about creatures that evade understanding. Cosmic horror is about the fear of meaning, the fear that as we grow in understanding, we will watch ourselves shrink out of the picture entirely. Perhaps in the tapestry of the universe, we don't amount to even a single fiber in a single thread. We are only the bacteria dirtying up the image until we are inevitably scrubbed clean. Human germs clinging to the surface of the filthiest planet in the cosmos. The existentialists ask, can't we find hope and meaning in our lives, no matter how small we may be? Cosmic Horror answers, no. Hope is for the strong. Meaning is beyond you. <laughs> What's the point? The point of what? Continuing. The, the mountain has already won. We weren't even playing. There is no escape. Not for you. I don't need any escape. I will escape. <laughs> How? <laughs> I'm losing it. You're not even real. I just thought you up to feel a little less alone. You want me to manifest you. You've been pushing me further into the darkness this whole time and... Why should I? I can give you deliverance. You don't have to be alone. All you have to do is be... Afraid. <laughs> Tape 9, Trojan Technology, begins with what I believe to be the earliest footage we've found so far. It comes from a radio broadcast from all the way back in 1963, announcing the National Access Initiative. It's more or less a program designed to get electronics such as telephones, televisions, radios, alarms, and flashlights into the hands of all American citizens. The groundbreaking project was, of course, backed by Simeodyne. Newspapers flash across the screen regarding President Kennedy's rejection of Simeodyne and subsequent assassination, implying that he was killed for resisting. The whole tape is interspersed with cutaways to footage from within several different homes in different time zones, seemingly recorded on hidden cameras and all dated from 1966 to 1967. Could the National Access Initiative be a front for getting spy cameras into the homes of Americans? Percival Rothwood, the CEO of Simeodyne, delivers a speech as part of the announcement. The speech itself is mostly political posturing, but an additional audio file of a private conversation has been slipped into the recording. Percival speaks with an unknown individual about Kennedy's rejection of the proposal, and bitterly remarks that Kennedy also shot down Project Northwoods. Towards the end of Rothwood's speech, we see a group of masked and hooded figures standing in the woods. It's all very cult-like, and I can't help but feel like we're supposed to assume that these are Simeodyne employees in the hoods. There's also a hidden frame where you can see a red mask that lines up directly with Percival's face, almost like it's setting him aside as a leader. But honestly, anything I could say beyond that is just purely speculation. I'll save all of that for later. The most chilling part of this video is the security footage from the end. It appears to be from another of Simeodyne's hidden cameras. This one's dated 1994, almost 30 years later. Naturally, the government was happy to put more cameras into the houses of American citizens. Boy. 
Sure, I'm glad the government doesn't spy on people in real life. One particular camera sits in the room of a young girl named Katie. Katie's eyes are weak, and the room is full of shadows. Tonight, Katie isn't alone. Katie isn't The imaginary friend lures her closer, closer. Katie locks eyes with the devil. And he unravels her, bit by bit. A hidden frame in the glitch section here shows this image. My best guess is that this is an image of a person sitting in the thought form manifester. Are they controlling the thought form that killed Katie? That's a chilling possibility, but it's also disturbingly close to the mission of Project Stargate. Using the thought form manifester, you could simply conjure a tulpa into somebody's home to observe them, or to brutally murder them without leaving a shred of evidence. Anyway, that's just a theory for now. The video ends with a recording from an answering machine from the home of Alex Marsh, the Simeodyne patient to whom tape 3 was addressed, and Tiffany Crisaldi, the mother from tape 5. So Alex, who later became a candidate for use of the thought form manifester, was the father of the baby who disappeared. How important is that? I can't really say. Let's go over one last tape. Then I'll try to tie everything together for you and we'll see if we can't work out some answers. The final tape, Messages from the Dead, is the longest episode so far, and it appears to be a direct continuation of Trojan technology. As with many of the other tapes in this series, Messages from the Dead contains fragments of several recordings, all roughly mashed together. The tape jumps between found footage segments of Jim Melgren, a few audio recordings of Alex Marsh, a coroner's report, and an interview with a young Tiffany Crisaldi. The first clip, one I'm not gonna show, 
is a recording of Jim Melgren picking up what appears to be a dead rat in the woods. Like, a real dead rat. Most notably, the gloved hand that collects the rodent appears to be the same hand that we saw in the jump scare in tape four. Does that imply that that was Jim? The, anyway, we then cut to more footage of the answering machine in Tiffany and Alex's home. We learn from a brief clip of an interrogation that these recordings are from the day Tiffany died. More voicemails play, and it's clear that Alex is becoming increasingly worried. He should be more worried than he is, because right now, something is happening at his home that is far darker than a woman giving in to despair. There's a brief cutaway to some sort of symbol surrounded by candles, which seems to imply that a ritual is taking place, even as Alex is attempting to call Tiffany. As I rewatched the series, I finally realized that the symbol is actually the Channel 13 WRAV logo. So the news station was involved in Tiffany's death? Eh, it's impossible to say what the significance of this is until we uncover more tapes. We're then thrown into a recording of Tiffany's autopsy report. As the coroner reports her age, the video distorts and casts some doubt as to the age that Tiffany was when she died. Okay, the female age 28, 29, 26, 33, 27, 25. The tape glitches and the captions at the bottom of the screen are replaced with a repeating phrase, REV96. That's the formatting used when citing Bible verses, and this particular verse is the book of Revelation chapter 9 verse 6. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. This, honestly, I, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know if that means that Tiffany was actually murdered, or if she gave in but just couldn't die. It's honestly really confusing, and this is just another one of those things that I don't really have answers for right now. We learn two really important things from this report. The first is that Tiffany exhibits certain malformations that are kind of similar to what we saw in Paul's crew. Their injuries were far from uniform, but Tiffany's corpse exhibits the same sort of oozing, ghastly appearance as John Rafferty. The most startling detail, however, is the bizarre mark that was carved into Tiffany's body several hours after her death. Later, in the privacy of his home, the coroner reveals something disturbing his assistant Sarah experienced. She told him that from the morgue, from inside Tiffany's cooler, she could hear crying. Of course, Sarah was sent home for the day. Too much stress, that was all. Her mind was playing tricks on her. However, when he can do so privately, the coroner admits that he could hear the crying too. We see footage from within the morgue itself, and we can hear the weeping ourselves. Even in death, Tiffany is still haunted by the pain of losing her child. It's both tragic and terrifying. Why is this happening to Tiffany? She wasn't part of the events on the mountain. Heck, she wasn't even involved with Simeodyne. Tiffany was simply a school teacher, a hopeful mother, and an innocent bystander, rolled over in Simeodyne's pursuit of the divine and the devilish. But what if Tiffany's connection with Simeodyne went back further than her relationship with Alex? What if the company had been ever-present in her life, and ultimately her death? Everything started here. It all began with Tiffany. She is only six years old, but she's living through hell itself. Tiffany Crisaldi is meeting with an unnamed doctor to discuss certain issues that she's been facing. The young girl is clearly apprehensive, offering up only a few words to answer each question. Children are rarely enthused about doctor's appointments, but something is definitely off about the conversation. Tiffany has been seeing things. No, that's not quite right. Tiffany is seeing things. Right here, in the midst of the session, she can see 
them. They're everywhere. The pair decides to move on with their session regardless, and they begin to do a mental exercise where Tiffany closes her eyes and the doctor describes a scene in front of her. I'm going to play some sounds that will help you through this exercise. Good. Now close your eyes and keep them closed until I tell you to open them. I want you to picture yourself standing outside your house in your front yard. It's a beautiful day out with big fluffy clouds and a blue sky. No one else is around. Now look down at the grass around you and watch how each blade moves in a gentle breeze. Now look forward and see your house. And look around and see the trees around your yard. Watch how the breeze affects the leaves as it passes through. Make the wind blow a little harder, enough so the branches are swaying a little bit. You can hear all the rustling of the leaves around you. Wind calms down now and you begin walking very slowly towards the front door of your house. Step. 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 And with each step you take, it looks like the day is getting later and later. Soon the golden rays of the sunset are shining against your house. The front door is closer now, but you still have some more steps to go. Step. 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 Now you're only three steps from the door. Step. The sun vanishes behind the trees, going down. Step. The stars begin twinkling in the sky above, and the moon shines its soft glow over everything around you. Step. You arrive at the front door. Reach out your hand, turn the doorknob, and open the door. Your house looks like it always does at night time, except you're the only one here now. You take off your shoes. First, the right shoe. Then the left shoe. You can feel the floor against your feet. You can smell the familiar aroma of your house. Everything is in its proper place. You are alone. You're going to walk quietly to your bedroom now. You come to the stairs and begin to walk up. You hold on to the banister as you go, letting your hand slide up. Step. 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 You reach the second floor hallway. Everything is in its proper place. You are alone. Nobody else is here with you. You look to the right and you can see your bedroom door closed at the end of the hall. And you start walking nice and calmly towards it. You see the door coming closer with each step. You can see the pink flower stickers that you put on it two years ago. And the small wooden sign that reads Tiffany with the little blue bird in the corner. Step. 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 You're at your bedroom door now. You reach out your hand and grasp the doorknob and turn it. The door opens, and you can see that your room looks just like it did the last you saw it. 
You see the colorful quilt on your bed. You see your small white dresser with all the stickers and scuff marks, just like always. Your stuffed animals are all resting by your purple toy box. You feel comfortable. You feel safe. You are alone. You walk into a room, and that's when you can see something different that's never been there before. Tell me what you see. It's... It's a door next to my window. That's right. It's a door. What does the door look like, Tiffany? It... It looks black. It has weird marks on it. The wood looks weird. Walk to the door and open it. I'm scared. It doesn't matter if you're scared. You must open the door. Good job, Tiffany. Now tell me what's on the other side of the door. It's a small room. Somebody's in there. No, Tiffany, you're alone. No, no, there's someone here, he's facing away from me, he's standing and tall, he's very tall. Tiffany, you are alone, nobody else is there, now tell me what else is in the room. There's a TV, the screen is all fuzzy, and the tall man is watching it. Tiffany. I want you to focus on removing the man from your mind. When I snap my fingers, he will be gone. You will be alone. The man's shaking. His body is cracking. Okay, Tiffany, I'm going to count down from five. When I snap my fingers, you will return to the real world. Five. You're feeling more awake. He's now. turning around. Four. Everything around you is becoming He's lazy. looking at me. He sees me. Three, Tiffany. You can feel the chair you're sitting in again. Two, everything around you fades to the blackness behind you. One, full control of your body. Zero, we're awake, Tiffany. You're eternally on now. This process, the act of creating scenes in the mind and walking through them, is known as active imagination. It's a form of what Carl Jung called shadow work. The act of blurring the line between conscious and unconscious. A method of freeing your shadow and bringing it out into the light. Unfortunately, whatever was sleeping in Tiffany's shadow brought along an all-consuming darkness. The man from her vision, the cracked man, bears a striking resemblance to the masked figure we've been seeing throughout the tapes. You can see him in the hidden frames and unexpected visitors, and walking in the woods and sleeping dogs. He kills Arnold Rivers at the end of Old Odd Ends, but the thing that blows my mind most is the fact that this same figure is visible for a few frames right before Tiffany's baby disappears. Somehow, Tiffany is extremely important to the story, and I believe that her relation to the cracked mask is the key to it all. Finally, this tape contains the beginning of a message addressed to Jim Melgren. The icon that the messenger uses to speak to Jim is the same symbol that was carved into Tiffany's body, but I don't really know what to do with that information yet. Before we can hear the full message, the tape cuts to a final clip from the morgue. It confirms what you might already know. Tiffany's role in this story is far 
from over. So, quite literally, as I'm finishing this video, they've posted a new tape to the channel titled Preparations for a Guest. It shows a person who's created some sort of holding cell in their basement. Towards the end of the video, the person starts playing sounds from Alex's interrogation inside of the cell, which makes me think that they're trying to somehow lure in Tiffany's shambling corpse to restrain it. I suppose that if you can't kill a monster, trapping it is the next best solution. The video is very short and doesn't show much else, but I wanted to include it here nonetheless. Now, let's get into the timeline. First, we have to assemble a timeline of the most major events we've seen throughout the series. There are a lot of undated events in Greylock, so it's only going to be a rough timeline. Maybe in the future we'll get a fuller picture of the narrative, but yeah, for now it's going to be rough. The earliest event, of course, is the collision with the rogue planet and the creation of our moon. I still don't know how important this is. I think it's important. So for now, I'll call it the beginning of the series. Then, for countless millennia, humanity traveled to Greylock to worship the thing living inside. When we arrive in the modern day, the mountain's significance seems all but forgotten. In 1964, Tiffany Crisaldi visited a Jungian therapist who utilized shadow work to help her connect with her unconscious mind. The session ends catastrophically, with Tiffany making contact with the cracked mask. A few years later, in 1966, a massive global company known as Simeodyne begins to spy on the American populace through the National Access Initiative. For 15 years, everything fell dead silent. Until in 1981, the first whispers of Simeodyne's true plans started to be heard. That year, Bernard T. Hayes gives a rousing speech at the Symposium on Jungian Psychology and the Manifestation of Consciousness. He believes that science is on the brink of bringing humanity to eye level with the divine. But it won't be for another 12 years until the fruits of his labor start to pay off. In the meantime, he's got a job offer from Simeodyne. Everything exploded in 1987. But the events of this year are kind of an unintelligible soup. I believe that the first thing to happen in 1987 is either Paul's crew clearing out the tunnels in Greylock, or the disappearance of Tiffany's baby. The cracked man appears in both instances, but they occur at basically the same time as far as I can deduce. Regardless of the order, I'm pretty sure that one event caused the other. It really hits the fan after this, and we see the beginning of the pregnancy phenomenon, the bodies raining in Cheshire, and the first wave of break-ins. That's right, the first wave of break-ins. In Unexpected Visitors, the emergency broadcasting signal interrupts a program from October 8th, over six months after the events on the mountain. I'm not sure this is intentional, but I'm going to assume that it is based on the absurd attention to detail we've seen throughout the series. This implies the break-ins reported on in Tape 7 were only the beginning, and that they continued for pretty much the rest of the year. In any case, the next event is from April, when Arnold Rivers records his account of what he saw in Greylock, and he's killed by the cracked mask. In May, Tiffany dies and is delivered to the coroner's office the following day. However, she manages to escape sometime soon after. Then, there's another gap until 1993, when Alex Marsh receives the Thoughtform Manifestor orientation package. A year later, in 94, we see a Thoughtform kill Katie through a Simeodyne spy camera. Finally, an unknown amount of time later, I believe that Jim Melgren uncovers the Simeodyne archives in Back Online and begins to learn the full truth about Simeodyne and their plans. Even with things in order, it doesn't answer the most important questions. What does it all mean? What's really happening at Mount Greylock and why? Where is this all leading? Do I really want to know? <sighs> then I will accept fear. Maybe fear holds hope, and maybe darkness holds deliverance. I think the most important concept in all of Greylock 
is the idea of shadows and masks. These motifs from Carl Jung come up time and time again. The concept of the ugly face of the human unconscious and the mask that we wear to cover it up. There's a sort of natural order to this relationship that's being inverted in Massachusetts. People's masks are starting to crack, shadows are leaking out, and the only ones who know are Simeodyne. Starting back at the beginning of the timeline, I do think that the collision with the rogue planet was an incredibly significant event, and I believe that the point of impact must reside directly under Greylock. Some part of me speculates that humanity is not from Earth at all, but that we were once an organism living on the rogue planet, deposited as microscopic invaders on the day the two planets met. It would have been an impact of absolutely cataclysmic proportions, but if there's even a tiny chance that a single cell survived, that would make Greylock the birthplace of humanity in some sense, at least on Earth. Is it any wonder that humanity would return time and time again to our only true home, to the shards of our dead planet buried under the mountain? Whatever the case may be, I believe that these shards are the reason humans have been drawn to Greylock for millennia. We share some special connection with them. In the modern age, it doesn't make sense to me that humanity would have simply forgotten about the truth under the mountain. Instead, I believe that Simeodyne might be the descendants of a group of Greylock devotees, now armed with cutting-edge psychology and technology. Of course, you may have figured it out by now that Simeodyne's influence is far greater than any mere company could hold. They seem to have the U.S. government in their pocket as they pull the strings on the whole show. Simeodyne, in my estimation, is really just a mask for some sort of cultish shadow government. Huh? <gasps> shadow government. Whatever is living under the mountain also has ties to the human unconscious. That's why Simeodyne is so interested in Jungian psychology, even going so far as to bring an outsider like Bernard Hayes into the fold. But how exactly are the mountain and the unconscious related? I can think of two competing theories. Either the thing living under the mountain is the source of the human unconscious, or the other way around. Really, it all comes down to what you think is under Greylock, the shards of the rogue planet, or the cracked mask. If it's the shards, I think that they are somehow giving us access to the unconscious. If it's the cracked mask, I think it's just an immensely powerful thought form. Honestly, my theory is that both are true. They're both under the mountain. I think the shards are the material cause of the phenomenon around Greylock, but the cracked mask is the personal, tangible force that serves as the antagonist of the series. But why has it just started to act now? Why did it appear in hidden frames on the tapes about the break-ins and Tiffany's ultrasound? The most likely explanation for the timing of events is that the cracked mask was trapped under the mountain and escaped during the events of Sleeping Dogs. Its release has been causing all of the phenomenon around Greylock, hence why it's appeared in hidden frames on tapes 4 and 5. In these instances, its mere presence is causing babies to disappear and people to become exceedingly violent. I'd even go so far as to say that the cracked mask is why Paul's crew turned into monsters. It isn't directly making these things happen, so we only see it in hidden frames. Meanwhile, in Sleeping Dogs and Old Odd Ends, we really see the thing. In those cases, I think it's acting personally, attacking Paul's crew and murdering Arnold Rivers. I won't be surprised at all if this trend continues in future episodes, as it seems like a pretty clear indication of how involved the Cracked Mask is in various events. We're getting closer to figuring out what's going on in Greylock, but the most pressing question remains. What is the Cracked Mask, and why did Tiffany see it during her therapy session in 1964? I said before that I think the Cracked Mask is an immensely powerful thought form, but in that case, who manifested it? I don't think that it was Tiffany, although it does seem like she has a unique connection to the monster. It could also be that some ancient group of Greylock worshippers manifested it, possibly even the ancestors of Simeodyne. This is a little bit closer to the right track, but it's still too limited in scope. No. The cracked mask isn't Tiffany's thought form. It isn't Simeodyne's thought form. It isn't anyone's thought form. It's everyone's thought form. 
every ounce of evil taken from all the darkest corners of men's minds and distilled down to one singular being, the pure manifestation of the collective human unconscious, the shadow of humanity. I mentioned that Tiffany was working with a Jungian psychologist, but I didn't mention that I fully believed that this therapist could have been a Simeodyne employee. Tiffany must have had some sort of sensitivity for the unconscious. The disturbing things she was seeing weren't hallucinations. They were psychic visions of those ordinary demons that live just under the surface. The demons that, if given enough attention, turn into violent tulpas. In 1964, Simeodyne sent Tiffany into the thicket. There, she saw it. The human unconscious. The lion. The devil. And he saw humanity for the first time in ages. Once he's looked into your eyes, a piece of you will be tethered to him and he will pull you like a thread and unravel you bit by bit. The devil, dear believer, lives in the hearts of ordinary men. There are still questions. Who was the messenger that contacted Jim Milgren? Why did bodies fall over Cheshire? Why would Simeodyne use the thought form manifester to kill Katie? I'm afraid I can't. I want to give a massive thanks to all of my patrons for just supporting the channel. Thank you Brody, thank you Drew, thank you Ty, thank you Moonvale, thank you Tristan, thank you Bone Broke Buddy, thank you Jay, thank you Max, thank you Mimi, thank you Timothy, thank you Asha, and thank you Tally. You guys are literally keeping the channel alive. Uh, it, I've been sick for like half the month, that's part of why the video is kind of slow to come out, but seriously, it's just been... Uh, Amazing to see all the support. Thank you guys so much. Finally, if you're interested in seeing more content on Greylock, I highly recommend my friend Manax's video on this same topic. Uh, we worked a lot together to just kind of piece together what was actually going on in this series because it was way too much for one guy. So yeah, go check that out. And thank you so much for watching the video.